Tonight's forum will give you an opportunity to learn and to be better informed before you vote. The questions for the forum were submitted by San Francisco residents. Many of you are in this room, as well as community organizations. So on your mark, get set. <laughs> we will start off with 75 second opening statements in alphabetical order, beginning with Brooke. I want to welcome the candidates. I want to thank you for participating in this forum. Please introduce yourself. Tell us which neighborhood you live in and why you are running for San Francisco District Attorney. Brooke. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Brooke Jenkins. I am currently serving as your San Francisco uh, I live in the Mission Bay neighborhood uh, here in the city um, where I'm uh, raising my two small kids who are six and two. Uh, but I'm running for district attorney because uh, I became a prosecutor in 2014. And one thing that I know is how personal this work is to those that we serve, both our victims as well as those who have yet to become victims, in addition to those who have been accused of a crime. And we have to make sure that the work that we do balances the need to be equitable and fair to those who are charged with the need to have accountability um, so that we can have public safety for everyone in this city. And since the day that I got appointed, that is what I've been trying to do, is to reintegrate accountability back into this system, uh, but in a manner, of course, that is fair and that is equitable. Um, I truly believe that we can balance both of those interests um, in order to achieve public safety and in order to help those who have offended um, and committed crimes in this city regain their ability to function as productive citizens um, in our communities. And so that is why I am running, because I am the only person um, who has any prosecutorial experience and who has ever done that. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joe Aliotto. I am a graduate. Is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? I am a graduate here at USF, so it's good to be home again. Uh, still not working? I can do it without it if you want. How about now? My minute up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start from the beginning. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. My name is Joe Aliotto Veronese, and it's good to be home. Uh, I did graduate here from USF as a, uh, a don at the law school across the street. Uh, born and raised San Francisco, and I live in the Cal Hollow area of this city where I actually um, grew up my entire life. Uh, I was a uh, police commissioner here in San Francisco. I was a uh, criminal justice commissioner for the state of California for seven years, a fire commissioner for three years, and I actually patrolled the streets of San Francisco in this neighborhood for three years. All of those years were in public service. All of those years were practically unpaid as a volunteer for the service of, to the service to San Francisco. I do that why? I do that because this is my city. And today, I don't recognize this city. And that's why I'm running for district attorney. It's not just about talk. It's not just about saying that, oh, we're going to make San Francisco safe again. It's about doing the work, getting out there, making the arrest, and making people safe again in San Francisco. We have, we have people in this city, many people in this city, that are fending for themselves. That stops under my administration. We get back to the work of actually protecting people here in San Francisco and delivering, delivering a criminal justice system, a 21st century criminal justice system that we all deserve. Let's see if this works for me. Is that, everybody can hear me okay? Good evening, USF. Uh, it is wonderful to be back here after, like Joe, I graduated from USF School of Law. Uh, eh, I know. I <laughs> stole it now. And um, 
neighborhood. I've lived in, I lived in North Beach for 27 years. Uh, I lived uh, in, now I live in Mission, uh, in the Mission with my uh, eight-year-old son who attends school in the Mission. And I'm running for this uh, seat because right now this city is in crisis. Uh, the corruption and mismanagement and backroom deals of a single administration has led this city into disgrace. That's why right now we need an independent district attorney, somebody removed from the politics and press conferences, and somebody that's willing to actually take action and clean up our streets. And we need to do this in a way that is both smart, compassionate, and thoughtful. It's one thing to just talk about crime and declare a war on drugs. It's another thing to uh, address users and dealers as separate individuals. And so we need to take a tough but smart approach to crime in this city, and that's why I'm running for District Attorney of San Francisco. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maurice Chenier, and I also am a graduate here of the University of San Francisco. <laughs> I've been practicing law for 29 years. I've been a trial attorney and a litigation attorney all that time. I never took a break. I'm about due for a vacation, and when this is over, I'm going to take one. Uh, <laughs> bottom line is, I am running for district attorney. Well, let me tell you where I neighborhood I grew up in. I grew up in the Ocean View District of San Francisco, one of the most dangerous in the United States. Drugs everywhere, murders everywhere. I've seen drugs, I've seen murders, I've seen rapes, I've seen robberies. It's time to stop. So I'm sending a message, this is why I'm running, to the Bay Area. Go buy an apple, any criminal, take a bite out of that apple, because that's the last free bite at crime you're gonna get if I'm elected the district attorney. I'm not playing. I don't have to convince anyone because I myself is convinced. And the bottom line is I will make this city safer and I will make it safer for everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to address you regarding my candidacy. Thank you all for being on your best behavior. I guess that trap door threat worked. <laughs> the first question will go to Joe. Can you outline how you are planning to deal with the fentanyl crisis from the higher level import and distribution down to the street level drug dealers? Furthermore, can you elaborate on how the drug enters the city and your strategy to get it off our streets? Absolutely. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, day one of my administration, the day I get sworn in, those investigators that are driving this district attorney around will go back to work, they'll go back on the street, and they will make fentanyl arrests on that day. There is no reason why that shouldn't be happening right now as we sit here today. But instead, what's happening is the police down in the Tenderloin are giving safe passage to kids after they get off the bus. When you're giving safe passage through drug dealers, through a neighborhood in San Francisco, who owns that neighborhood? The drug dealers do. That stops on day one. They get arrested. Justice comes to them. But what's critically important is that we work with our other law enforcement partners. We have done this for many, many years, and it has faded off because of frictions between administrations. But we need to uh, recreate our task force with the federal government. We need to recreate our task force with the marshals. We need to recreate our task force with parole, probation, and the marshals. And we need to do this because we know the drugs are coming from outside the United States. We know that they're coming up through Arizona. We know that they're coming up through San Diego. And we need to stop it from its source. But we send a message on day one when I become district attorney that, 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 that the days that you run these streets, those days are over. Let me be clear, the war on drugs has never succeeded in 50 years in the United States. And that's an initial fact that we have to accept. We in San Francisco cannot stop the cartels, but what we can do is address the street level dealing in San Francisco. And we have to do it in a serious and smart way. It's not just about lock them all up and throw away the key. We've tried that. All it does is bring out more dealers, and more dealers now fighting for turf. 
That's why we've had the increase in violence, because once you sweep a block, then they're fighting over the next block. So we have to do it intelligently, and we also have to make a big distinction between dealers and users. And we, all, we have to address the demand side of this, because ultimately, no matter how low or how high the cost goes, as long as people are addicted to drugs, they will seek out drugs. And so to stop the drugs on our street, we have to address the demand side of it. And the demand side of it means getting treatment for users, helping them and building out programs which our current administration has, has failed us drastically at, and that's the reason we have the crisis on our streets. Thank you. Okay. I, I want to uh, interrupt you for a minute. I really appreciate your applause. The problem is it takes time away from the speakers. So let's keep it to a minimum. Just <laughs> thank you. You can't fight drugs without partnering with the federal government. So that'll be the top level. At the lower level, users and dealers will go to jail. I want to be clear. The reason why is you cannot fix a user without getting them into the system. Now, uh, if you're a serial recidivist and you want to keep doing drugs, at a certain point we have to stop spending good money on bad. For example, we had one in a newspaper, one person, four people, cost the city $4 million in one year, going back and forth to the hospital on overdoses. I'm going to set a moratorium on that. Hey, fine, you're sick, you have a drug problem, we're going to try to fix you one more time. Beyond that, you're going to go to jail. As far as dealers, I have no sympathy for them. I've been seeing them all my life. Unlike a lot of you, you haven't seen them. I saw them on the way to school in the morning when I went to St. Michael's, dealing drugs, pushing poison on the people. I am simply fed up with the nonsense that's going on in this city, and I intend to change it for you. Now, one of my biggest things I'll do is block access. I'll put both users and dealers in jail. If you don't shape up, you got to ship out. That's the bottom line. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you. The uh, second question, we'll start with... I'm sorry. <laughs> People are uh, I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> Please, go ahead. I think, I think people already know my policies, but, uh, but I'll reiterate them. Um, I truly believe we have to have more accountability in this realm. For several years, I handled these cases myself um, and know what accountability looked like and didn't look like. And what I know is that the DA's office effectively decriminalized the sale of drugs over the last two and a half years. I did come in and take a tougher approach because we need a tougher approach. We had 1,700 overdose deaths in a matter of two years, and that's unacceptable. Uh, we have a job to do. Um, and quite frankly, the people in the Tenderloin and Selma in the Mission are begging to have clear streets where their kids can walk, where the elderly can get by without um, having to inter be inter uh, interfered with by people uh, dealing drugs, building lines being lined up. Um, and so um, what I have done is to implement what I believe are the necessary policies, including right, seeking pretrial detention for those who have egregious cases. Some of you may have seen in the news the guy who was arrested with almost eight pounds of fentanyl, and absolutely that's something, someone that we sought to detain pretrial because he should not be on the street ready and prepared to keep handing those drugs to the low-level dealers on the street. Um, we are also making sure that these dealers are admonished that should they be connected to selling fentanyl to somebody that overdoses, that they could be charged with murder because we have to hold these people accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. My apologies. It goes, just goes to show even Supreme Court justices make mistakes. <laughs> the second question will start with John. C-A-R-T, CART, stands for Compassionate Alternative Response Team. It was crafted in order to have an alternative to the current practice of having police respond to homeless. The concept is a deeply trained and well-paid pure response that centers unhoused people while responding to 911 and 311 calls from San Franciscans concerned about the presence of unhoused persons. Have you endorsed CART? Why or why not? John? Uh, 
this may be rigged, but uh, I uh, started CART. Um, I, was, I was on the police commission when we passed a, 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 a resolution directing the formation of CART. Uh, I worked with a large group of stakeholders to develop CART over the process of two years. Um, we eventually got funding for CART, but uh, it was held up by, again, this administration, uh, which has focused all of the resources on policing the homeless as opposed to supporting the homeless. Um, ultimately, uh, CART is a good program. It's a program that we need because, look, I, you know, I worked on the police commission just like Joe. We know that police are not workers for the unhoused. They're not social workers. They're not trained in this. So what we need is the proper professionals to come in and to address them, connect them with services, and help people find housing, find mental health treatment, find substance abuse treatment. Because, you know, I, you, you look out on the streets and you're upset at the conditions on the streets, but, you know, these are real people living out there and we have to treat them with compassion and, and give them justice through our system. And that's what CART was formed to do and I'm proud to have been uh, one of the people who started it. Uh, Your Honor, may I hear the second part of the interrogatory, please? I the missed it. The concept is a deeply uh, trained, uh, well-paid peer response that centers unhoused people while responding to 911 and 311 calls from San Franciscans concerned about the presence of unhoused persons. Can you, have you endorsed CART? Why or why not? I will endorse any program that helps get drug addicts off the street. I will endorse any program that helps get drug addicts off the street because that is one of my primary concerns. I see, I, I went to an interview the other night and I saw drug addicts lined up on Golden Gate Avenue right around the corner from here. I must have saw at least 200 drug addicts lying down and sitting down on the street. We need to do something. Intervention is necessary. Whatever's in place now is not working. So. Yes, it would be in conjunction with my policies to get yourself straight or go to jail plus cart, that's fine. The, uh, the combined approach and attack will resolve this problem here because the people are also suffering, not just the homeless people, the people, the citizens are under siege. So we have to think of both the citizens and the drug, I call them drug heads, whatever you want to call them, drug addicts. You have to think of both. So with that in mind, anything that helps homeless and the drug addicts get off the streets, I am 100% for. Thank you. No applause, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm in favor of both CART, the Street Crisis Response Team from the San Francisco Fire Department, anything that allows um, us to have intervention with the unhoused and that also doubly benefits us in allowing the police to address um, the, the criminal conduct that's going on. As we know, we have an, a police department that is almost 600 officers understaffed. We need them focused on uh, those who are committing crimes in the city um, and spending their, their time and resources on that. Um, and I feel that having having ridden around actually recently with the street crisis response team in particular, um, that the work they do is extremely valuable in trying to intervene in those who are living on the street, some of whom actually, um, and I witnessed one woman resist um, their assistance, but who they monitor, who they know they have really relationships with because they try to help these people um, you know, r routinely. And so I do believe that they are an asset to helping to make sure that the unhoused get connected to resources or at the very least are offered the opportunity um, to be connected to resources because that should always be the first step of intervention. Um, and I think we actually need to do a lot more um, to make sure that we're helping people get off the street and not leaving them to languish because that is absolutely not compassion. So with all due respect to Mr. Hamasaki, and I do have a ton of respect for him, before there was CART, there was EMS-6 uh, in the fire department as a fire commissioner. In fact, uh, I believe the rigs that are used for CART are, came from the fire department. They were old, uh, actually brand new. Um, uh, there were brand new vans that were being used that, that we actually paid for for purposes of, uh, uh, of ambulances, but they turned out to be too small, so we, we gave them back to the city, and now you see them driving around doing this good work. I am supportive of CART, but here's the problem. 
Homelessness is not a crime. We need to fix this system. You've got CART, you've got the HOT team, you've got EMS6, you've got all of these people out there that are just moving people around. We see that as San Franciscans, and it drives us crazy. What's happening is our government is failing us, and we're spending billions, about $3.5 billion every year on homelessness, addiction, and, uh, and mental health. But the problem is, while homelessness and addiction are not crimes, mental health surely isn't a crime eventually it can turn into a crime. I was walking on Market Street one day with my son, and there was this man out of his mind sticking a needle into a tree, yelling at it not to stop. And he turns to me and he says, Dad, when does that person turn around and stick that needle in us? That's what we're experiencing in San Francisco. We are failing the city. You don't see it in the Presidio, you don't see it in Marin, and you certainly don't see it in San Mateo. Question number three. We'll start with Maurice. According to the National Registry of Exonerations, more than 3,200 people have been exonerated from criminal convictions in the United States since 1989. Joaquin Surya was exonerated by the Innocence Commission this year after spending 32 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Will you commit to continuing the District Attorney's Innocence Commission. Maurice? Yes, and in fact, I've actually worked in conjunction with the Innocence Project in California to try, and I was part of a team that freed one individual. Uh, the bottom line is, it, the root cause of that is failure to disclose. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Failure to disclose is the root cause of 90% of the convictions that we have because as a district attorney you're supposed to turn over all evidence exculpatory or otherwise to the other side I don't want to win by hiding evidence I'm gonna put the evidence on I'm gonna let the jury decide win lose or draw that's what you'll get for me and as far as the innocence project goes I'm all for it if someone's innocent they don't belong in prison but Keep in mind, there's two different types. There's actual factual innocence, and then there's legal innocence. One, they're quite different. So the numbers that I, I just heard don't mean that some of those people weren't uh, guilty. They may mean that some of those people were not, uh, you could, they were not legally guilty. So be careful with that. But I am for an innocence project, and I've actually worked for the Ninth Circuit Pro Bono Project as one of the appellate attorneys freeing people. Brooke. Uh, I've already publicly committed to continuing the work of the Innocence Commission. Um, I've actually already uh, spoken with and met with uh, Professor Laura Bazelon, who is a, an esteemed professor here at this law school, um, to make sure that not only are we continuing that work, but we're enhancing the way that it's done. We're enhancing the way that referrals come in because we want to make sure that we are extending our reach um, to um, as many inmates as we can who want their cases reviewed. Um, which is there was no mechanism um, under the last administration to do that, which you know could be just be a result of the fact that they didn't have enough time, but that's something that she and I have been talking about as, as well as other ways to expand the scope of the work um, to make sure that we're bringing in uh, the cases that we need to review. And so it's work that I'm committed to, certainly as the district attorney. Um, we just recently appointed our office's member um, to that commission, uh, which we're really proud of. Um, and one thing that most people don't know uh, is that that when I was in private practice before I became a prosecutor, I actually did prisoners' rights work. I worked on a habeas petition for um, somebody who was a client. And so um, this is work that I've been committed to even before uh, being a part of the criminal justice system. But it is certainly work that our office is continuing now. Please. <laughs> Joe. Thank you, Your Honor. A absolutely, I'm supportive of the Innocence Commission. In fact, I think we need to expand it. We need to expand their, uh, their authority. Uh, we need to have uh, the Human Rights Commission involved. We need to have the public defender involved, prison rights activists. But here's the, here's the issue. The reason why we need an Innocence Commission is because we have bad cops, right? Every city has bad cops. Now, look. We've been working on this issue since I was police commissioner in 2004 through attrition, hiring thousands of new police officers, hundreds of new police officers since that time. But you know what we also have is 
We have bad prosecutors. And, and, and my, uh, my colleague up here mentioned, you know, when you withhold evidence from a criminal proceeding, evidence that is exculpatory, evidence that if known to the other side frees a person and you put that person in prison, you have violated their civil rights. And I've been a civil rights lawyer for more than 22 years now, a civil rights trial lawyer, uh, trying cases in state and federal courts around this country. And I can tell you one thing, we have bad cops fixing the criminal justice system, uh, fixing, uh, reforming the criminal justice system requires us to rid that system of bad cops, but it also requires us to rid that system of bad prosecutors. And we have bad prosecutors. You know, I think the, the Innocence Commission is, is uh, um, it, that's pretty easy. We're all going to agree on that. Nobody believes that innocent people should be in prison. But um, as my, my colleague Joe said, we do have a problem that I saw on the police commission with police officers not telling the truth. But we have a system of checks and balances. And the check on bad cops is good prosecutors. Now, right now we're sitting in a situation where we have an administration that has just had an ethical complaint filed by a judge that has had, yeah, I think so too. No I mean, I think so too. Um, that has had a uh, appellate decision against them for uh, prosecutorial misconduct, that has had allegations of uh, coaching child witnesses, that has had uh, sustained allegations of withholding discovery, just like my colleague to my left mentioned. That is the way that innocence is lost. That is the way that innocent people end up in prison. That is unacceptable in San Francisco in 2022, and we need to clean up the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. Please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've already lost two questions. So please, we're going to move this along without applause. Question number four starts with Brooke. Avoiding transfers. Did I leave anybody out that time? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Pardon me? Oh, okay. He did. He did. I got this. <laughs> Avo avoiding transfers from youth into the adult criminal justice system is critical to ensuring youth can maintain access to age-appropriate rehabilitation services and for immigrant youth to avoid life-altering damage a conviction will cause, as opposed to a juvenile adjudication. How will your office respond to youth involved in criminal justice? So I released a policy that uh, made it clear that we start with the presumption that all youth are to be uh, maintained in the juvenile justice system, but that there is an exception, um, which is for 16 and 17 year olds who commit very egregious or heinous crimes that we will consider the need to uh, petition to have them transferred to adult court. And that is founded in the fact that we have an obligation to protect the public. And when I was a kid growing up in the Bay Area, the worst drill that I had was duck and cover to get under my desk for an earthquake, but that my six-year-old has to undergo uh, active shooter drills in her school because of the fact that it is not uncommon to have 16 or 17-year-olds go in and execute rooms full of children. That we had just recently somebody who was a teenager go into a grocery store and based on racism, execute black people who were shopping. Um, and so we have to be sure that at the moment that they are released from the juvenile system, which is by the age of 24, that we are in fact confident that they have been rehabilitated and should be reintegrated into our communities. And if you have a blanket policy of never right, engaging in the discussion, you can't even have a conversation about whether or not 24 is long enough. And so I made it clear that that is the basis for why, because we have people who commit very heinous crimes. You know, I believe that we are professionally negligent in having a blanket policy uh, on this particular issue. Um, we have to treat every circumstance different. Uh, of course, that's true in every criminal matter, but it's especially true when we're dealing with our children. We have an obligation to our children. We have an obligation to make sure that our children, that we don't put our children into a system 
that they end up in for the rest of their lives. That's the criminal justice system that we have here today. And we need to change that. So when you talk about juvenile hall, that's a prison up there. I've been up there. When you talk about juvenile hall, we need to reform the system. We need to create alternatives so that we are not punishing our children even further than the way they've already been punished, whether it's from living in a household of other people that have committed crimes, whether it's from being oppressed by the criminal justice system or just being oppressed, period. We have an obligation to our children, but we treat every single one of these instances differently. And of course, there are going to be these heinous crimes that are committed by children. We see these kids coming from the East Bay down to Chinatown to prey on our vulnerables down there, on our vulnerable people. We cannot tolerate that. We have to hold our parents accountable, and we have to let people know that we're not going to tolerate this anymore in San Francisco. Let me start by saying, um, as we've discussed nationally, children do not belong in cages. It is destructive to their youth. We understand, we all know now, this is not debated, that children's brains mature more slowly. They have bad judgment. They don't make good decisions. We have to protect them. We have to get them into the right systems to avoid the school-to-prison pipeline. Um, The incarceration of youth, as our current district attorney proposes, um, we have a long history of doing that. I have a personal experience with that um, from when I was in high school. One of my friends accidentally uh, killed another, and he was 16. And by the district attorney's definition, that's a heinous crime. But he was tried as an adult and sent off to adult prison where, um, as his dad told me, he spent every night crying and every day having to fight to exist. So, look. I understand there's serious cases and violent cases that we have to address, but we need to start treating children like children and treat adults like adults. Thank you. Over the past 10 years, I've been studying the brain. I've done traumatic brain injury cases. And in fact, The youth of today are much smarter than the youth of 20 years ago, primarily because they were exposed to so much information. So I think that the developmental age should be lowered because I think at 16 years old, in most instances, a person is able to know what's right from wrong. So in that connection, if you commit a heinous crime on a case-by-case basis, if you're 16 or older, I'm going to take a second look at it. And that is true. And if you don't do that, you're sending a message that as long as you're not 18, you can go out and slaughter people. Look what happened in Florida. That was a heinous result from a jury, and I think we need to stop that. And, and look, it's on our doorstep. Don't think it can't happen here. You're in the comfort of your own homes and watching TV and going and sipping lattes and everything else, but guess what? There's a crazy person. He may be 16. He may be 50. He might come and shoot all of us. So to a To protect against that, I think we have to, everyone has to be evaluated, everybody, whether you're a youth or not. Then we can make that determination. But I'm not going to blanketly exclude it. No. Thank you. The next um, question, we'll start with Joe. This uh, uh, is appropriate, Joe, because you can pick up right where you left off on the last question. Hate crimes against minority populations have been on the rise attacks against various communities, such as Asian, Armenian, Arab, have suffered various attacks in the Bay Area. What will you do, one, to ensure uh, perpetrators of hate crimes are brought to justice, two, provide communities with access to law enforcement resources to prevent hate crimes, and three, create a tolerant community for all San Franciscans? Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, for the last 22 years, I have been a trial attorney trying cases in state and federal court uh, around this country. Um, Most of my cases, I have to prove racial animus. That's what's at stake here, is having a prosecutorial office that is brave enough to charge a hate crime and that is competent enough to actually prove it. 
Now, I've been doing that. There's no mystery behind it. In some cases, you have the smoking gun. I have nooses in my cases. I have nooses in a lot of my cases, but in a lot of my cases, I don't have nooses. And so I have to still prove those cases by circumstantial evidence. And I do prove those cases. I do it successfully. I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid to send the message to those, com- those people that are coming to San Francisco to pray on our vulnerable. We are not going to tolerate it. Your days of praying on our people are over in San Francisco. That's not the message that we are sending today. And so we saw those pictures, those horrendous pictures of our city commissioner who was brutalized by one of these people. That commissioner is endorsing my campaign because he knows that stops under my administration. And it stops by sending a message. This current DA hasn't charged a hate crime yet. What message is that sending? Thank you. John? So... um you know, I appreciate all of the politics around uh, and, and the attention that's been given to the Asian American community around this, but this is a real and personal issue to some of us. You know, I've been the victim of a hate crime. I went through the criminal process as a victim. I understand the failings and the um, of, of the criminal just, justice system and prosecutors to treat victims compassionately, to cr- treat victims with care, to have language-appropriate services, to have trauma-informed services, to have wraparound services, because we, for too long, have treated our victims as just, um, you know, they're another witness, and this is what we're going to use to score a conviction and get a notch on the wall or whatever. Uh, But, you know, these are real communities that are hurt, and this is my community that's hurt. I've been around this community for all of my life and all of my career. I'm the 2020 past president of the Asian American Bar Association who faced these issues head-on when I when the pandemic struck and the rise in anti-Asian violence took over in this city and this country. So I appreciate uh, all of the kind words, but um, you know, I really wish folks would step up and, and be there for the community instead of just talking about it. November 7, 2005, my nephew was slaughtered in San Francisco streets. I've seen death firsthand. Hate crimes are particularly heinous, but everyone is entitled to protection. You should not be robbed because you're white, black, yellow, or brown. You should not be shot because you're white, black, yellow, or brown. Under my administration, I guarantee you, crime is crime, and I will prosecute it accordingly. So if you are a victim, you will get the same treatment that any person of a different race would get. And I will be draconian on a racial animus. I too have tried civil rights cases, both defense and plaintiffs. And I know what the burden is. Plain and simple, it's an evil crime. If there's an evil motive attached to the crime, believe me, I will gladly accommodate them with the appropriate request for sentencing and the appropriate prosecution. So with that said, I am particularly against any uh, discrimination and abuse because of race, and I will treat it accordingly. Thank you. Brooke? So first of all, it's very different when you are in the criminal system. It's not the same burden of proof as in the civil courthouse. Uh, We have a duty uh, to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, and we have an ethical obligation not to charge something that we can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I spent two and a half years in this city as the designated hate crimes prosecutor, and I tell you it's one of the hardest things to prove because it's one of the only crimes that requires proof of motive. You have to prove what was going on in the mind of the perpetrator at the time they committed the attack or the robbery or the murder. Um, And so what I have said is that we will prosecute anyone who commits a specific type of crime in this city to the extent we we can and we should. Um, Whether or not there's a hate crime charge, there's still going to be accountability. But we cannot charge things simply because it's politically cute to do so. We have to make sure that we are only charging people with the actual crimes that we believe they committed and that we can prove that they committed. And so that's what I'm... uh, 
uh, determined to do is to make sure that we follow that ethical obligation, uh, but to make sure that our victims are supported through this process, that they understand the decisions we're making, and we've done a lot to build up our victim services division to make sure that our victims have the support that they need, have the language services that they need in order to understand this system. Thank you, Brooke. The next question, please, the next question goes to John. Many communities have historically been distrustful of law enforcement, and that includes the district attorney's office as a law enforcement agency. What role do you think trust and transparency play in the district attorney's office? And as district attorney, will you commit to being as truthful and transparent with San Franciscans, whether about the inner workings of the office or about your past as a private citizen? Yes, I think it is, um, you know, the prosecutor has a special role in our, in our justice system. It is not, um, as you might be led to believe, just to secure convictions and put people in jail. It's to do justice. And you do justice by being truthful, by being honest, by having an open file system where all of the discovery is shared with all of the parties. Um, and you don't hide evidence. You don't hide behind uh, press conferences and photo ops. What you need to do and what I would do as prosecutor is try to work to restore trust within the communities by actually treating them fairly once they're in the criminal justice system. And that includes victims, that includes witnesses, and that includes offenders. Just because somebody has committed a crime against our city does not mean we stop treating them fairly ethically or morally. We have a duty as prosecutors to uphold justice. And as, as prosecutor, that is a role that I take seriously. So I would absolutely commit to having uh, an open policy on, on you know, everything that goes on in the office and an improve uh, data and accessibility for, for all people. Thank you. Please. When I first started practicing law, the great lawyer, Ron Wilson, taught me two things. He said, tell the truth, because you don't need to lie, the truth will do. And second, he says, the whole profession is witnesses and documents. And that was the easiest way to sum up the legal profession. So it's not as complicated as you think. It's pretty simple. You have to turn over, as John said, turn over the evidence, transparency. I would work in conjunction with the police not against them, but if there's something wrong with the evidence, I will certainly tell them. I don't want to go to trial with uh, false evidence, and I will not go to trial with false evidence. I will make full disclosures, and I'm committed to transparency, but I think if you just work your cases up correctly, let the chips fall where they may, full disclosure, and if the judge thinks the case is inappropriate, he'll throw it out. If you get to trial, then the witnesses are evaluated by the jury, the jury decides. But I will not withhold any evidence at all, and I will work in conjunction with the police department, the witnesses, and the victims. Keep in mind, the victims, let's not forget them. You have to work with them as well. Thank you. Brooke. Thank you. So we are, we've had an open file policy for some time now, so that's still in existence. The other thing that I'm working to do is to make sure that our data dashboards don't just reveal and display charging uh, statistics, but also display case resolutions so that people um, in the community understand just how these cases are being resolved, whether or not that promotes accountability, whether or not they want to determine or look at if there's any disparities in treatment amongst offenders. Um, so we're trying to work hard in the office to get that data and make it available. Um, the other thing is to make sure, again, that we understand we have to take a holistic approach um, towards this work. We don't get to only look at, at this work through the lens of just the victim or just the person who's accused of the crime or even just the people as the city. We have to take a view that looks at everybody. So we should always be incorporating any, any remarks that we want to make to include um, not only a victim but an offender's family. I've had multiple situations where I've talked 
to them with the approval of the defense lawyer to let them know, right, why we're making a certain offer or hear what they need to present to me about a case. And that's work that we will continue to be doing. We've also invited the community into the table. Um, I had multiple meetings with community stakeholders regarding the juvenile policy that I released to make sure that the community hey, is thank included. You, Brooke. Joe? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. So th this question is about distrust of the criminal justice system, and we have every reason to distrust the criminal justice system. When I was 20 years old, I entered the police academy because of the Rodney King incident. I saw that man brutalized on the side of a freeway like many of us did, and I decided I needed to be a part of the change. So I entered the police academy at the age of 20. I went through two police academies because when I came to San Francisco, I, I, I went through again as a, to become a DA investigator. I worked in the San Francisco Police Department. I know what a bad cop looks like. I investigated bad cops when I worked at the district attorney's office. I was on the officer-involved shooting team. I investigated cops. But people distrust this system, and it's not, and let me give you some reasons why they distrust this system, because it doesn't work for them. When you walk around the streets of San Francisco and you see a $15 billion budget, and you see the crime, you see the mental health, you see the addiction, and then you see how people are victimized on a daily basis, that's why people don't distrust this, that's why they do distrust this system. They distrust this system because they see a district attorney that has all these policies, but doesn't actually do anything. That's why they distrust this system. We have to call it as it is. Thank you, the Joe. The question is about distrust. Thank you, Joe. Audience, please, you've been so good. Let's not break your record. I don't want to have to fine you. The next question, we've already had to skip one question. Let's not skip any more. We want to hear from the candidates. This has been an excellent discussion. Please cooperate. The next question will go to Maurice. San Francisco has one of the highest crime white rates in California, while our neighbor, San Mateo, has one of the lowest. How would you account for the large disparity between our two counties? Morris? 2005, I had the unpleasant experience of dealing with Kamala Harris and Anna Gonzalez. My nephew was killed, murdered, and I got all kind of excuses as to why it couldn't be done and what obstacles existed. I don't want any other family to go through that. Never again. What I'm trying to do, and to answer this question, is that there's a disparity in the charging because of the, st the charging standards are different. Here in San Francisco, we have a real, real high charging standard, and they have selective prosecutions as opposed to you have enough evidence to go forward, you need to go forward. So I'm going to take the three-pointer like Steph Curry. If we have enough evidence to go forward, I'm going to go forward. That's the reason. They are draconian in San Mateo, they don't tolerate the excuses. All I'm gonna do is adjust the charging standards. If I have a decent witness and you tell me there's something wrong with them, I'll let the jury decide that. I'm not gonna make that determination. So uh, we can equal it all out by simply uh, committing to stop the crime that's going on here just as San Mateo County is doing. Bruh. Please, no, no applause. Brooke? So having been a prosecutor here for eight years, what I can tell you is San Mateo doesn't mess around. They have, they have harsher penalties for crime in their county than we do here. Um, and I've watched um, as certain things here have been decriminalized uh, by the DA's office. There's been selective enforcement of laws um, by our DA's office over, over the, the course of a number of years that have contributed to people believing that certain types of crimes are okay in San Francisco. Um, now, of course, we always want to be um, our own person. We want to make sure that we are being the most equitable and fair that we can. We want to rely on responsible alternatives to, to incarceration. So should, we should never be trying to copy or emulate some other county. Um, but at the same time, again, we need to restore accountability to San Francisco. And I've made it clear accountability can look like many different things. For some people, it is.
it is a requirement of drug treatment. For some people, it is making sure that they go through a vocational training program. Uh, for others, it's mental health treatment. For some people who commit very serious and violent and heinous crimes, it might be prison. Uh, but we have to have consequences on the table for people that commit crime in San Francisco. And that has been the problem. Um, we have had people who have basically said it's a free for all. And so they have decided that this is the more opportunistic place to come commit their crimes. Please. Uh, nobody's decided that this is a more opt 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 uh, optimistic place to come commit a crime. It is. You can walk into a Walgreens and steal whatever you want and walk out and not be prosecuted. That's happening today. You can grope women all over this city. And the only time you're going to get arrested is when you make a news article about it. Women are fending for themselves in this city. This is bad. And yes, crime is up in the last four months, by the way. And you know why crime is not up in San Mateo or Marin? Or just jump over the wall from the marina into the Presidio? Because they don't tolerate it. Two words. It's leadership and action. Those are the two words. Leadership, action. That's what we need from a DA. That's what you're going to get when you elect me. John? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I do recognize that, that it is true that violent crime has shot up um, since the, the recent appointment. Uh, looking at the two of them, it's complex, okay? Sam, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a secret from uh, the criminal justice side of things. San Francisco is everybody's favorite place to take a case. Why? Because you can go to trial. Why can you go to trial? Because they don't put together good cases here. That's, I'm sorry, but it's just the history of it. In San Mateo, the investigators, the police, actually put together pretty airtight cases that you know if you go to a jury, your chances aren't very good. So there's a lot of pleas and a lot of resolutions, and they can get higher terms because they have good cases. We have never had good cases. It's, I dare say, uh, it's easy to try a case in San Francisco against uh, this office in its current state. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's the truth. So what, and that's why, that's what's happened when you lose leadership and management in favor of politics and press releases. This office needs leadership now. Please. <laughs> thank, thank you, John. We're going to run out of time. Please. <laughs> the next question will go to Brooke. What are you doing or will you do to address root causes of crime, especially petty crime like car break-ins, property crime, theft, and low-level drug dealing? Yeah, so we have to do a number of things, and it depends on what the issue is. For, for um, our people who have substance abuse disorders, we need to make sure not only that we're getting them into treatment, but that we allow them a chance to be successful at treatment, which means they can't be confronted with a drug dealer every 10 feet as they walk down the street, um, especially in the Tenderloin, where most of the drug treatment programs are. Um, we have to make sure, because when you look at the ecosystem, right, uh, drug dealing fuels addiction. Addiction is what makes people, right, go out and commit these low-level crimes to support their habits. So we want to be making sure that we're getting them into our drug court, into our community justice center, into individualized treatment programs to help them actually stay in recovery. Um, the other thing is we need to, with most of our low-level offenders, if not all, again, make sure that we have responsible alternatives to incarceration that actually propel them in a, in a positive direction. You can't tell somebody, hey, don't come back and commit another, don't go out and commit another crime, but not equip them with the ability to be successful. And so one thing that I've done as a prosecutor myself is to make sure that we are using what those programs are to make sure that if it's somebody that needs a job, just who grew up and never had hope of, of being able to take care of themselves, that we have them engage in vocational training, get their GED, all those things, so that they can be successful when we send them out of the system. Joe? Uh, criminal justice reform is something that absolutely needs to happen. Um, and it's, it's become a national conversation, but it's got to start in San Francisco. It's the only place where we can be successful, where we can start to show success. I've been a civil rights lawyer for almost 20, 22 years now, and I understand, I fully understand how our criminal justice system oppresses people of color 
And so we need to look at those root causes. There are things like cash bail. Rich people shouldn't get a pass. They get a pass in this current system. Uh, civil assessments. No-knock warrants. We see no-knock warrants killing young, indivi- young African-American individuals all over this country. These are the things that we need to focus on, but we have to work closely with Sacramento to get this done. Sacramento tried to abolish uh, cash bail. We brought it back as voters, and we brought it back because there were no great alternatives. We absolutely need an alternative to get people back to court, but we got to work with Sacramento, and I know a lot of people in Sacramento that I can work with, including the governor, to make sure that we have alternatives so that we can do away with those tools of oppression that currently exist within our system and truly begin the work of criminal justice reform. John? The the criminal justice system exists as it is currently to clean up on the back end what we didn't do on the front end. When we provide communities and people with the resources that they need, people are not driven to commit crimes, especially low-level petty theft, car break-ins, property crimes that we're talking about right now. So, you know, as I'll agree with uh, um, interim district attorney Jenkins here, that we need to provide services. How you go about doing that is probably where we would differ. But I agree that people with mental health need mental health treatment. People with substance abuse issues, that's the root cause. That needs to be addressed. People that are unhoused and are, you know, impoverished, that don't have a bite to eat, if they steal a loaf of bread... Are we going to put them in prison? I, I just don't agree with that. I think there are ways to divert a case like that, to teach somebody that it's not acceptable, and connect them with services so that they have the opportunity to succeed. We have to give all people, not just the people like us that went to law school and were able to become lawyers, but everybody the chance to succeed. Thank you, John. Please stop the applause. Maurice. There, for low-level crimes, I'm not a heartless man. I'm going to make exceptions and try to help anyone who's involved in crime at the lower level, as John appropriately said, stealing a loaf of bread or a serial jaywalker or whatever you want to say. The bottom line is I'm going to help. That. That's not who I'm going to target. So one of the things I had planned to do is I'm going to have like Tuesdays once a month community. I'm going to try to help the kids get jobs so they can stand on their own two feet and stop stealing. There's plenty of jobs out there. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to go to the neighborhoods. I'm not just going to sit behind the desk and push paper. I'm going to go out and see what the problem is, who needs a job, and try to get them in contact with people who can actually get them a job so they can be productive members of society. So I think that is how I'm going to do it. But as far as the thefts, I don't necessarily agree that thefts are always petty crimes. Keep in mind, you steal someone's computer these days, you've taken their whole life for the most part. So we can't just classify crimes as uh, quality of life crimes when they're not. We have to have a distinction. But for those crimes that reach that threshold level that go over and become a serious crime, I will certainly uh, prosecute those crimes. Thank you. No, you're, I, I went, yeah. Is everyone finished with that question? Oh. <laughs> Another mistake. <laughs> the uh, next question goes to. That's for me, Your Honor. Okay. Oh, yeah. The San Francisco Police Commission recently found that only. of reported crimes in 2021 led to an arrest, San Francisco PD's lowest rate in 10 years and among the lowest law enforcement success rate in the country. How do you believe this lack of solved crimes will play into your job as district attorney? It has 100% to do with the lack of leadership and the low morale in this city. I was a police officer. I took many risks. I knew the look on people's faces when I showed up and I gave them safety when they called 911 in the middle of the night. We are the number one job 
the number one job of the district attorney in San Francisco is to keep people safe. We are failing our people in San Francisco. Our police commission needs to stop worrying about the things that they do and start doing things that actually keep people safe. They've got a policy that says that once you get into a vehicle, the police can't chase you, right? Now, there is some good policy behind not having car chases in the middle of urban cities. I get that. But day after day, when you parade a police chief in front of press conferences and you demoralize the police department, though you're sending a message to those police officers that we don't support you. And on day one, I will send the message. I will support the good police officers of this city that do their work, and I will support them by putting consequences back into crimes. If you take the risk to make a good arrest, I'm going to do the work to make sure there's accountability in that system. There is no person up here Thank you, that Joe. will bring that back, bring morale back John. like I will. Um, there was a Chronicle uh, data piece uh, a few months ago that showed that San Francisco is actually the most policed city in California. We have the most police here per capita, and we have the lowest crime rate, uh, clearance rate. Now, why is that? Well, um, you know, I hate to say it, but four years on the police commission taught me there's a problem with the culture. And until we fix, and I was, I'll, I'll tell the truth, I wasn't able to fix it on the police commission. The, the culture is ingrained within the police union that has a belief that, um, you know, some of them believe that we don't matter. And that's been covered extensively by a very centrist journalist, Heather Knight, uh, where she's covered, <laughs> uh, that actually gave our, our interim district attorney her debut. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem. And until we address that, until we make, co- you know, there was another data point that came out the other day. Only 25% of cops live in San Francisco. How invested are you in a city you don't even live in, but you take a paycheck from? We need to change the culture Please. of San Francisco and San Francisco policing. Thank you. Maury. I went to St. Ignatius College Prep, and just about everybody who went there uh, had a relative who was in the police department. So I grew up respecting the police. Now, you have to understand, they have a very difficult job, a very difficult job. So when you hear nonsense like, let's defund the police, well, that doesn't work for anyone. When we defund the police, they hear that. They're worried about going to jail because they shoot a suspect who's shooting at them. We have to, uh, globe, it's not just the police department. We have to change the way we evaluate things. Have you ever been shot at? I have. It's a split second decision. And guess what? It's very difficult to make. And these police officers do that daily. And I want to thank them for it. I'm not going to attack them. And I, my position would be to work with the police to make it happen. Let's get together, jointly investigate, jointly prosecute these things and jointly assist the community in getting back to standing on its own two feet instead of this demolished community we're in. This is an abyss, like a zombie land. We gotta stop it. Brooke, please. Yeah, so of course we have to acknowledge that they're understaffed. We have to acknowledge that they have been uh, demoralized, as people have just pointed out, for a number of reasons, um, including, like I said, the decriminalization of a number of crimes by the DA's office and a refusal to prosecute those um, who have rightfully been arrested. Um, What I have done since taking office is to try to foster a working relationship with Chief Scott um, and his command staff, as well as have my chief deputies meet um, with the command staff to try to form a new working relationship and a partnership, what San Francisco needs, quite frankly, to move forward um, in the right direction. In addition to that, I've gone around to the police stations. I've gone to five so far, six so far, um, to talk to the rank and file, to say, no, gone are the days where we don't value the work that you do. If you investigate a case correctly um, and you bring it to us, we will make sure that there's accountability. Uh, because we have to make sure that they 
feel motivated to do their work at the highest level and to do it again the right way. And so that's what I've been trying to do because, of course, we know that if they don't make arrests, if they don't solve cases, um, then there's very little for us to do on the prosecution end. So we need to really move that ball forward. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. The next question will start with uh, John. A part of social justice means reflecting on past societal woes, issues, scars, such as over-policing in the war on drugs. What will you do to prevent over-policing on low-income minority areas? What I'll do, hopefully, is win the election in November. Um, look, you know, the interim district attorney uh, has restarted the war on drugs, targeting minority uh, communities disproportionately. It is also, this administration has also um, suggested they're bringing back life in prison for somebody who uses drugs with another person, if that person happens to die. That, the truth is tough, I understand that, but that's the case. So what that does, every public health professional will tell you, every public health professional will tell you that this prosecutor will cost human lives. People will die because of the ignorance of the, the policies that have been repudiated across the country. Um, please, and so, ladies and gentlemen, please <laughs> cooperate. And uh, so, look, we can't have these racially discriminatory policies. We cannot do the war on drugs where people who are uh, using drugs together may be charged and may be prosecuted for murder. Then people do not call help for help. They do not call 911. This is proven. This is best practices. I don't know how this came out, and nobody bothered to do a quick Google search, but this is going to cost Thank lives. Thank you, John. Morris. Maurice. Thank you. There are a lot of inequities that went on before I was born, and, and, and they are continuing to occur. What I will do is to have a uniform approach to enforcing the law. That means color doesn't matter. Sexual preference doesn't matter. Your racial background doesn't matter. So to help historically, uh, historic communities that have been discriminated against, what I will do is help you by not employing a system of discrimination. Now, I'm going to target the most serious crimes. So day one of my administration, I'm going to grab every single Ramey warrant case in the last 20 years, and I'm going to take them to the grand jury. That's a promise. If there's a witness around and if there's a victim around, if there's a victim's family around. So what you can do for the minority communities is to help them get the same treatment that all other communities get. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to treat everyone equal. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what your race is. All I care about is that you're a human being and you're entitled to dignity, respect, and protection of the law. Brooke. Uh, as a black woman, uh, Raised by my black mother with a father who's from El Salvador, I guarantee you I understand the inequities that are in this system. I know what it looks like to have family members come through this system and receive disproportionate sentences. I also know what it looks like to have family members who have had um, their loved one murdered and not have an opportunity at justice um, in this very city. And so we have an obligation to make sure that we're serving all communities. And what most communities of color will tell you is that they want police, they just want good policing. They don't want to be right beaten, they don't want to be ha have evidence planted on them, but they want to feel safe. And they want to make sure that when something happens in their communities, that they have somebody in this system who will do the right thing and fight for justice so that we're not left to fight for it for ourselves. And so that's the key, is to make making sure that we are an office and we are a police department that reflects the communities that we serve, who does our job the right way, and who gives justice to each and every person who comes through this system, both victim and offender, to make sure that that restores trust overall into this system. 
Thank, thank you, Brooke. Joe? Equal justice under the law. The job of the chief prosecutor of this city is not to prosecute color, race, or any other identifying aspect. It's to prosecute behavior. That's what we do. But as I mentioned in one of the prior answers earlier, the criminal justice system is broken. There are tools of oppression that have been built into the system. As a civil rights attorney, I've been working to fight that on the civil side. I was also a member of the Omega Boys Club where we took these at-risk youth kids. We put them into after-school programs. We sent them off to colleges of their choice, and we paid for those colleges. As your next district attorney, I'll be doing those call-outs. I'll be using the authority, the, the stature of the district attorney to call in some of those billionaires and give jobs to these at-risk youth. There's no reason why we can't be doing it. And I forgot to mention in my last question one thing. Five years ago, I started the National First Responders Fund. And in the last five years, as a founder and executive director of that organization, we are in 364 uh, departments around the country and in 36 different states. We support first responders. I'm telling you, the first responders, the morale will come back when I become district attorney. They know I have their back. Thank you, Joe. The next question goes to Maurice. Governor Newsom recently signed into law AB 2195. It provides prosecutors with the discretion to offer an alternative public nuisance plea in specific drug-related cases, and this will allow citizens and non-citizens to avoid collateral consequences of drug convictions such as homelessness, unemployment, and mandatory deportation. Will you direct your attorneys to offer this alternative plea um, uh, and, and if so, under what circumstances? Maurice? Thank you. I'm responding in a vacuum because I haven't actually read 2195, but it sounds like uh, it's discretionary. And with that in mind, alternate, uh, alternates to uh, convictions and to restore civil rights are always the preferred method. You want to get people back into the system. Again, my administration will target the serial recidivist, not the, the person who's down on his luck and can't afford a loaf of bread. What we need is to respond to that level of crime. That level of crime is what's causing the problem. We have a heinous level of crime that's being ignored on collateral issues. That issue, to me, 2195, great. Let's help anyone restore their civil rights. Bottom line is, we have a serial recidivist who's going to go out and kill you or your kids or your family or your relatives. I don't want to be a part of that. So I will make the distinction. I will enforce the law because it's required. I will enforce it as, the, as it exists. But again, we have to look at the whole big picture. Are we letting a serial recidivist back out on the street? Thank you. Brooke? Um, we have an obligation as a DA's office to ensure that we are taking um, immigration status into account. That's something that we've been doing, that we will continue to do. Um, we fully understand what that looks like in our line of work. We, of course, have to make sure that um, when we look at people uh, who are continually picking up um, more serious crimes, you know, what we, what we can do for them, um, we should always be making sure that we have, again, the the form of accountability that's appropriate in each and every situation. Um, and it looks different for different people, and we should always be trying to explore uh, what ways that we can rehabilitate somebody while still hopefully um, holding on to their ability to function um, as, a, as a full human being in our society. And that's regardless of whether or not you're a citizen or not. Um, we want to make sure that we give everybody that, that initial opportunity to do so. Um, and for some people, you need a second chance and a third chance, but we have to be paying attention to what type of crime they're committing, how many times they've committed it, what their background is. There's all sorts of things that we look at. Um, and we most certainly, as a DA's office, respect that we're a sanctuary city. And regardless of what somebody is ultimately convicted of, we will not participate with ICE or any other immigration um, agency in the United States to facilitate anyone's deportation. Thank you, Brooke. Joe? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Collateral consequences are at the core of what criminal justice reform is here to fix. 
as I mentioned, the tools of oppression that are built into the system. Any tool, whether it's from the governor or the legislature, or wherever that tool comes from, whether it comes from a, 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 a health care provider, these are the tools that we need to be using in the criminal justice system to keep people from becoming, or breaking laws, rather. Because as I mentioned earlier, addiction is not illegal. Addiction is a, is a, is a public health crisis, right? We need to get these people help. We need to get people who are having mental health crises help. But when they're standing in the middle of Lombard Street, out of their minds, throwing rocks at cars, or trying to, stick a, trying to stick somebody with a needle, that's when it becomes a crime, and that's when we failed you as San Franciscans. And so whether it's this tool that the governor gives us or any other tool, it's always good to have more tools in the toolbox of the prosecutor here in San Francisco. And as your lead prosecutor here in San Francisco, I will use every tool to keep you safe. That's my number one job. If you don't feel safe in this city, I've failed you. And that's why we're in the position that we're currently in. I support uh, the bill signed by Governor Newsom, 2195. It builds on previous law in uh, California that uh, requires prosecutors to consider a person's immigration status. What this does is give an immigration safe plea where otherwise they would be deportable. Now, we just went through this recall and um, the interim district attorney made a big uh, argument for increasing people charged with fentanyl to make them mandatory deportable. Uh, and so that's what this law was done to stop or to give another option to. Because, look, you can say we're not going to deport them from San Francisco, but the minute they cross county lines or ICE finds out about them, they're still getting deported. And if the punishment is exactly the same, okay, the punishment is exactly the same. They are facing the exact same consequences by under the new law as they would under um, the sales of fentanyl. The same prison, the same jail, the same probation, the same parole then what's the only difference is their deportability. And so when prosecutors want to make people deportable, even though they won't cooperate with ICE, I think that's a problem in a sanctuary city like San Francisco. We're losing questions. The next uh, question will go to uh, Brooke. In September 2022, San Francisco's Board of Supervisors passed a... 15-month pilot program granting the San Francisco Police Department more live surveillance powers. How will you oversee police surveillance? Who will be responsible for making sure that the police follow the regulations as written and ensure that the data is deleted on the timeline set out in the regulations? Brooke? Yes, yeah, so we as prosecutors should always function really as a, a checks and balances for the work of the police department. And so, of course, if we have evidence that was obtained illegally or against some, some particular um, protocol or law, then, of course, that's something we take into account um, in deciding whether or not to proceed. And it's also something that the defense bar pays attention to in order to file a motion to suppress that piece of evidence. Um, I did support the Surveillance um, Act because, in our view, you know, when you've been a trial lawyer, in the, in the criminal system here in San Francisco, um, one thing is clear, our jurors want video evidence. Um, San Francisco jurors are, in fact, the toughest jurors to try a case in front of. They want to make sure they are convicting the right person. And so video evidence um, allows us to make sure that the juries have what they need in order to make the right decision. What it also equally does is give us as, pro us as prosecutors the ability to exonerate those who are not guilty of a crime. And I tell you that since since becoming DA, I've had to review multiple cases involving video surveillance footage. In one instance, I was able to determine, along with my staff, that somebody acted in self-defense, and therefore we would not move forward with charges. And that may not have been the case without that video evidence, because there was no witness who had come forward. Thank you, Brooke. Joe? I had a jury in the Fifth Circuit of Texas. They were the toughest jury I've ever seen in a, in a racial discrimination case, nonetheless, with 10 clients who were all African Americans. You want a tough jury. Um, listen, we have, uh, 
we have, we have a U.S. Constitution. We have a California Constitution. We have all of these rules that protect us as individuals and our rights to privacy, right? But if you are out in the street and you are doing something in the view of the public and a private camera catches you, should a prosecutor use that as evidence? Absolutely. But should a prosecutor obtain that evidence in, inappropriately? Absolutely not. The rules of evidence apply. Your constitutional rights to privacy apply. So if it requires a warrant, go get a warrant. Go do a little legwork as a police officer, or a DA investigator, or a DA. Go get a warrant. I've gotten dozens of them when I was a DA investigator, late in the middle of the night, showing up at a judge's house to get a signature so that I can get a video released. This is the hard work that the DA's office should be doing. So don't worry about all this noise and what the Board of Supervisors is doing because the reality of it is your constitutional rights to privacy and all of those other rights that are layered on top are protecting you as individuals as long as the prosecutors are following those rules and they're not always following those rules. We can go to 17. End it. You want to go to 15? Can I go? I don't know. I don't know. May I go? May I? Okay. Um, look, I worked on this surveillance ordinance on the police commission. There already was an ordinance in place that allowed police uh, live access to surveillance for serious and violent cases. All this does is allow it for low-level cases. So basically, it's creating a system of mass surveillance in San Francisco. Uh, San Fran SFPD, unfortunately, didn't fo follow the existing law and ended up getting sued by the ACLU for live monitoring protests. And so the idea that you can go out as a citizen and protest against your government in a controversial issue, whatever your particular positions are, and the government is going to surveil you, to watch you, to follow you, to see where you go, to watch what you do, that to me uh, stands in the face of freedom that I believe America stands for. And so I oppose this uh, ordinance. Um, they weren't able to follow the first one. They broke the law there, and the ACLU had to come in and clean it up. And now, it's, and it's not just the security cameras. It's everybody's cameras they're going to have access to. It's, and so it's mass surveillance, and it does not make us any safer. I, I think we have time for, for one more answer. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's kind of form over substance. I'm a big fan of electronic surveillance, but the right way, as Mr. Veronese, if I didn't pronounce it right, I'm sorry, uh, mentioned. We need to go through the hoops. We need to get the, uh, it's not, it's a law in motion matter. You go to the court and ask to get the right to conduct surveillance. Now, uh, surveillance, when you're out in the public, there's, you're basically in the public domain. So post-crime surveillance, to me, is protect, it's not protected. For example, if you commit the crime and you murder somebody, then later you're, you're arrested and you say, oh no, you shouldn't have got that because you didn't go through the hoops to get the, uh, the Fourth Amendment hoops. That shouldn't be a concern. What they're talking about is live surveillance, and that may intrude into your Fourth Amendment rights. However, I will say it's not absolute. If you go to the border, you don't have Fourth Amendment rights. I don't know if you know that, but Fourth Amendment doesn't apply very, that very well at the, at the uh, border. So with, unless there's a state of emergency, there's no harm with going through the motions, getting the law in motion that you need to do, and get the proper documentation in order, and getting what you need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maurice. We have time for one last question. Um, I'm going to overrule my handlers and, <laughs> and uh, do a uh, different last question because on the evening news, I saw the horrible problem they're having in Manhattan in the subway. So, uh, Joe, you're going to start this uh, round, and the question is, how would you improve public safety on public transportation like Muni and BART? Look, uh, 
public transportation, whether, whether you're walking down the street or you're on a city bus, uh, you deserve to feel safe in this city, right? But we see, actually, just last week, we saw a muni bus being used as a getaway car for a bunch of people who had stolen stuff from a store, right? That's the city that we live in. But we need to empower police officers. We need to give them better training. We need to get the police commission to support them. We need to get the board of supervisors to support them. We got to get the morale up in the police department. But we also have to put the sheriff's department to work. In any other county in this country, the sheriff's department are the chief patrol agents of any county. We got to put them, we got to get them out of babysitting these city buildings, put them to work patrolling the streets of San Francisco, hire new police officers, don't defund the police department. If you want to defund the police department, try reimagining what police de the police department should look like. Try reimagining what a 21st century criminal justice system should look like. And in my opinion, we need more patrol officers out in the street, more walking the beat, more living in this city, like I did. I patrolled the area where my mother lived. It mattered to me. That's what we need in San Francisco. We just don't see it. The cops have thrown their hands up. That's got to stop, and it'll stop Thank under you, my Joe. administration. John? So one of the things that I, I worked on, on on the police commission was also um, what... Uh, Joe just mentioned, which is uh, getting police officers out of their car into the community, walking footbeats. Um, you know, there's some opposition to that uh, for a variety of reasons. But, you know, having police officers out in the communities where there is uh, increases in violent crime or dangerous crime, I think is a good thing. And we need to have police officers that are willing to do the work, that are willing to engage with the community, be part of the community. Because, you know, it doesn't matter um, if you're a cop and you're out there. If the neighborhood doesn't trust you, if the people don't trust you, nobody's going to come to you for the problems. That's why they need to reestablish both the police and the prosecutors, reestablish trust with communities to have true public safety. Because without it, um, you know, there's there's two sides sitting on each end wanting the same thing. But we need to work together and we need to rebuild trust. Thank you. With respect to public transportation, you have a very vulnerable population. That means you have children, you have elderly, you have everybody riding the buses and the public transportation. It needs heightened scrutiny. So I'm fully for police getting involved with the community, being present, actually riding on the bus with the citizens daily. I think that interacting with the community is important, but you, have to, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I don't want the police around, and then complain about crime. You have to incorporate the two. They cannot unilaterally fix themselves. So with that in mind, we have freedom of association, and I think that is the most beautiful freedom in the Constitution. You can associate with whoever you want. You can ride a bus at midnight, and go buy a donut if you want. That's the beauty of America. Now, there's people who are going to prey on you and stop that and try to stop that. We need police officers to be involved in that, and I 100% would support a, a conjunctive effort to uh, get that uh, resolved with the community and let them trust us that we, the police and law enforcement, are with you. We're not against you. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. Brooke? I think, again, we have to restore accountability back into our system because that's the only thing that's going to function as a deterrent to people who are committing these crimes um, because that's the biggest thing. We, we, sure, we could go with enhancements. We could, you know, there are specific charges that relate to conduct that happens on um, muni buses and, and modes of transportation because people are uh, confined to that space. But that's not necessarily always the answer. The answer is making sure that, again, um, as we promote accountability, that it looks appropriate in each and every case. We, of course, want to also be emphasizing prevention um, and what that looks like on a policing side. Um, I don't know that it necessarily looks like a police officer on each bus, um, but we, of course, want to make sure that they're in, in an area where they can be responsive if something happens um, and equipping our muni drivers with the ability to make the necessary calls to law enforcement when and if something happens. And so I think increasing our work uh, with muni, with BART, in order to make sure that those who are on the train or on the bus are able to call and contact authorities when something happens so that they can respond more quickly um, is the best way to go about allowing if, uh, law enforcement to intervene. 
Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Now we come to the candidates' closing statements. We will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order. And remember, you still have 75 seconds. You've cooperated wonderfully tonight, and I thank you. We'll begin with Maurice. No free bites at the apple. As I said earlier, I'm not a heartless man. I am going to target the serious criminals, the ones who are threatening your lives, your property, our jobs, our economy. Keep in mind, when these clowns commit crimes like they're doing now, they're driving businesses out of the city. I work in the insurance industry, and I hear every day, boy, we can't wait to pull our company out of California because of all the claims that are going on. I'm here to change that. I'm here to make you safe. And on November 8th, you have a decision. The decision has to be made. Do you want to continue with the status quo? Do you want progressive and selective prosecutions? Or do you want someone who's going to simply enforce the law? I'm a simple guy. Nothing esoteric about me. I'm a six-pack Joe. I have a beer once in a while. <laughs> Bottom line is, if you commit crimes, and this is a simple analysis, you don't have to be smart or brilliant or uh, a scientist. I'm going to enforce the law equally, and I will ask for maximum punishment for serious crimes. Thank you for the opportunity to address the city and county of San Francisco. I'm going to stay away from his apples. Uh, <laughs> It's a dangerous business. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for you know being a great audience. Um, I'm excited to be a candidate for the next district attorney of San Francisco. Uh, you know, I think what we really need right now is serious leadership and management. Um, we need to put aside the politics. We need to put aside the press conferences. We need to put aside the connections to um, the most corrupt administration in the history of San Francisco. We need a strong, mature, competent district attorney to run this office, to get it back into shape, and to lead by example. And that means the highest ethical conduct um, and the highest moral and uh, value system running through the prosecutor's office. So I would ask you to join the Democratic Party, uh, Harvey Milk, Rose Pack, number of elected and appointed officials who have supported me as the next district attorney of San Francisco. Joe? Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't even recognize this city anymore. I grew up on these streets. I've got a 13-year-old child, and I want him to have the best version of San Francisco, the version that I had when I left the house at 10 o'clock in the morning and my mother didn't see me until dinner time. No cell phones, no pagers. That's the San Francisco I want to deliver. That's not the San Francisco that we have. We've got women fending for themselves. There was at least four or five police reports that happened. They crossed the desk of the district attorney before there was a press conference about this person being a warrant out for this person. You need a district attorney that is going to keep you safe. That's the number one job of the district attorney. And I promise you, as your next district attorney, I will bring you the leadership to do that. We have an administration that lives in an alternative reality. These two individuals that are flanking this, th these desks over here, these are DA investigators. She doesn't understand what it's like to walk the streets of San Francisco. She doesn't understand how safe it is. That's our reality, and that's why I'm running to become the next district attorney of San Francisco, because I understand that safety is priority number one. I'm going to give you the best version of San Francisco that we have seen in decades, and you're going to hear about you, me, uh, one person being the only prosecutor Thank up you, here. Joe. Look at the last five district attorneys. Brooke. What I will tell you is I'm the only one who's done the job for, for eight years. For eight years, I've dedicated myself to San Francisco, to its victims, and even to those who have committed crime here. And when I walk around this city, I don't just get greeted by people who want more order and want more 
uh, safety, but I even get greeted by people who I've prosecuted, people whose family members I prosecuted who come up to me and say, thank you for being fair. Because that's what I've tried to bring into this role since, since 2014. Being a black and Latino woman coming in wanting to make sure that this system was more equitable to people that look like me, but also to fight for justice for victims, most of whom look like me. And so that is the key to doing this work is to making sure that it's not just talk, tough talk, but that it's actually knowing what it takes to do the job and to do it well. And so that is that is what I have to give to San Francisco, is to lead this office, not just by my words, but by my actions, because that's what I've been dedicating myself to uh, for many years now. And so I believe truly that right now we have an opportunity to restore San Francisco to what it can be and what it has been. Um, and we just need to keep pushing forward. Thank you. I want, I'd like to uh, thank all of our candidates for a good discussion. I think you have informed the people in this room and the people across the city who are listening. Um, this is more of what we need in a dem democracy. We need to have civil discourse among our candidates. I think we got that tonight, for the most part. <laughs> I want you to know that I supported myself uh, through law school by being an RA in this building. <laughs> Th this was the cafeteria. I had so many bad meals in this room. <laughs> Thank God USF is not serving dinner tonight. I, I want to thank all of you for participating in this discussion. Um, uh, your vote has consequences, and you being here tonight realize that more than anyone else. So let us all keep informed. Let us vote in November, and let us keep our city safe. My, my last.